The Department of the Interior and Local Government, Central Luzon, presents this series of instructional videos as part of the formulation and updating of LGU Comprehensive Development Plans. The fifth step in the mainstreaming of SIDRA is called Disaster Risk Assessment. It is defined as a methodology to determine the nature and extent of risk by analyzing potential hazards and evaluating existing conditions of vulnerability that could potentially harm exposed people, property, services, livelihood, and the environment on which the population depend. Risk assessment involves risk mapping and include review of the technical characteristics of hazards, such as their location, intensity, frequency, and probability, analysis and exposure and vulnerability, including the physical, social, health, economic, and environmental dimensions, and evaluation of the effectiveness of prevailing and alternative coping capacities with respect to likely risk scenarios. The formula for computing the level of risk is obtain the likelihood of occurrence of a hazard and multiplying it with the severity of consequence score. There are five steps in disaster risk assessment. Assign the likelihood of occurrence, determine exposed elements, consequence analysis, risk estimation, and analyze adaptive capacities. There are seven processes involved in disaster risk assessment. First is to determine the likelihood of occurrence, then determine exposed elements, consequence analysis, risk estimation, analyze adaptive capacities, identify the decision areas, and prepare a summary disaster risk assessment matrix. And lastly, identify policy interventions to reduce risk to acceptable levels. Two major outputs are expected in this step. First is the disaster risk assessment summary decision areas and issues matrix. And the second one are the risk maps. To put it simply, risk is the expected losses, such as lives, persons injured, property damaged, and economic activity disrupted due to a particular hazard for a given area in reference period. On the other hand, likelihood of occurrence is the estimated period of time expressed in years that a hazard of a certain magnitude is likely to repeat itself. These are the recommended parameters for the likelihood of occurrence scores. Actually, we already accomplished this in step one during the hazard characterization. You may use the result of that process for this particular activity. Meanwhile, severity of consequence is a measure of the degree of impact, such as injury, death, damage, interruption brought to the sector of concern. It is the function of exposure and vulnerability. We estimate the severity of consequence by obtaining the magnitude of hazard, extent of exposure, and hazard vulnerability. In evaluating the severity of consequence of a particular hazard on each exposure unit, you may rate it as very high if it meets the following conditions. For population, more than 20% are affected and in need of immediate assistance. For urban use areas, 
40% of non-residential structures are severely damaged or more than 20% of residential structures are severely damaged. For natural resource-based production areas, 40% of exposed production areas or means of livelihood such as fish ponds, crops, poultry and livestock, and other agricultural and forest products are severely damaged. For critical point facilities, damages may lead to the disruption of services which may last one week or more. And for lifeline utilities, disruption of service lasting one week or more for municipalities and one day for highly urbanized areas. For high severity with a score of three, the same criteria are also laid out for each exposure unit, but the percentages are less as compared to the very high rating. For population, it is more than 10% to less than 20%. For urban use areas, it is more than 20% to less than 40% for non-residential structures. And for residential structures, it is more than 10% to 20%. For natural resource-based production areas, the parameters or the range is 20 to less than 40%. For critical point facilities, damages may lead to disruption of services, which may last three days to less than a week. And for lifeline utilities, disruption of service by approximately five days for municipalities and less than 18 hour disruption for highly urbanized areas. For moderate severity of consequence, the range for population is more than 5% to 10% of affected population. For urban use areas, it is more than 10% to 20% of non-residential structures or more than 5% to 10% of residential structures. For natural resource-based production areas, it is 10% to less than 20% of exposed production areas or means of livelihood. For critical point facilities, damages may lead to disruption of service lasting for one day to less than three days. And for lifeline utilities, disruption of service by approximately three days for municipalities and less than six hours for highly urbanized areas. For low severity of consequence, the range for population is less than 5%. For urban use areas, it is less than 10% of non-residential structures or less than 5% of residential structures. For natural resource-based production areas, it is less than 10% for exposed production areas or means of livelihood. For critical point facilities, the disruption is less than a day. And for lifeline utilities, disruption of service by approximately one day for municipalities and less than six hours for highly urbanized areas. After completing the scoring for all hazards, multiply the likelihood of consequence or LOC to the severity of consequence or SOC and use this table to determine the level of risk. For example, if the LOC is frequent and the SOC is high, then it is six times three equals 18. Based on the matrix, the risk score from 12 to 24 or the squares with red highlight means that the risk is high. A score ranging from six to 10, those highlighted in violet is equivalent to moderate risk. And scores from one to four means low 
risk. This is an example of a flood disaster risk assessment for population exposure. Highlighted in yellow are the likelihood of occurrence and severity of consequence scores. To obtain this, you need to conduct a workshop or consultation with key stakeholders. The LOC can be based on the historical record of hazards and the hazard characterization workshop, while the SOC will be determined by key people based on the parameters provided by the guidelines. The other columns such as sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and vulnerability can be supplied by the exposure database and the CCVA results, while the risk scores are computed by multiplying the LOC or likelihood of occurrence to the SOC or severity of consequence. You need to get the average risk score of all the barangays to obtain the estimated risk for the whole city or municipality. Then do the same process for other exposure units and hazards. By evaluating the risk scores of each barangay, you will be able to draw out which area or which barangays are the most at risk to a certain hazard. This is where you can select the decision areas. From this, create a disaster risk assessment summary matrix by identifying first the barangay, then the exact location, the description of the area, and the technical findings based on previous analysis. Then, identify decision areas and interventions. This will be included in the summary matrix in step six. There are seven risk management options that we can choose from in order to address the hazard scenarios in the decision areas. Number one is risk avoidance or elimination. It is removing a risk trigger by not locating in the area of potential hazard impact, not purchasing vulnerable land or building, or denying a risk by creating an activity or simply refusing to engage in functions that could potentially be affected by risks. Number two is risk mitigation. It is reducing the frequency of occurrence or the severity of the consequence by changing physical characteristics or operations of a system or the element at risk. Number three is risk prevention. It is instituting measures to reduce the frequency of occurrence and magnitude of a hazard's adverse impact through the establishment of structures such as levees, flood walls, dams, and sea walls. There are two ways to implement risk mitigation or prevention. The first is structural, and the second is non-structural. Fourth is risk preparedness. It refers to mechanisms to anticipate the onset of hazards, increase awareness, and improve capacities to respond and recover from the impact of hazards. Five is risk segregation. We implement this through duplication or redundancy by increasing system sustainability, by providing backup support for elements that may become non-functional or disrupted during and after the hazard impact. Another way is through separation. It is by increasing system capacity and robustness through geographic, physical, and operational separation of facilities and functions. Six is risk sharing or risk transfer. It is shifting the risk bearing responsibility to another party 
often involving financial and economic measures, particularly the use of the insurance system to cover and pay for future damages. And number seven is risk retention or acceptance. This is the do nothing scenario where risks are fully accepted and arrangements are made to pay for financial losses related to the hazard impact or to fund potential losses with own resources. We are now in the final step of SIDRA, which is to summarize findings. The two objectives for this step are to identify major decision areas based on the combined risks and vulnerabilities and to identify a menu of disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation options within major decision areas. We also have one main output, which is identified major decision areas and list of risk management and adaptation mitigation measures. We will attain this through the process of identifying major decision areas and further detailing of the identified policy interventions. Major decision areas are specific sites within the municipality or city where level of risks to hazards can be exacerbated by vulnerability to climate change. Identification of major decision areas can be facilitated by overlaying risk and vulnerability or tabular in approach. There are two effective ways to generate the major decision areas map. The first one is by overlaying all the hazard maps with only high susceptibility. Here in this example, the red areas are highly susceptible to one hazard. The maroon areas are highly susceptible to two hazards. And the dark areas are highly susceptible to at least three hazards. You can consider the areas which are highly susceptible to at least two hazards as the decision areas. The second way is to delineate the boundaries of area that was identified by key stakeholders as the decision area in their barangay. Finally, summarize the findings by using the matrix in the previous step, then adding two columns, which is the impacts or implications and the policy interventions or proposed solutions. Here again are the adaptation options and mitigation measures. Bear losses, share losses, modify the threat, prevent effects, change use, change location, research, and encourage behavioral change through education, information, and regulation. This ends our overview of the SIDRA process. I hope that this brief course was able to equip you to mainstream climate and disaster risk assessment in your comprehensive development plan.